We're on Daf Tes Amid Aleph, and we're talking about measurements. So the Gemara now says, "Kama Hushir Shal Kos." What is the measurement of a kos? There are a number of reasons why you need to know what the measurement of a kos. We're talking about a kos of Revius, for Kiddush, for Abdullah, for a number of other things. So the Gemara says. Rebbe Yosi b'shem Rebbe Yosi ben Pazi v'Rebbe Yosi bar Bibi b'shem Rebbe Shmuel etzba ayim al etzba ayim al rum etzba umechza u'shlish etzba. Now, if you recall, we had this sugi in Maseches Psachim just a few weeks ago. The the measurement here is two fingers by two fingers. That's the uh, width and the length of a let's say a cube, um, and the height is two is rather one and a half and a third of a finger height. Someone pointed out to me that they don't think that this is the exact same measurement as it is in Psachim. I didn't check, but it sounds a little, it sounds approximate to it, but there may be some slight discrepancy. We'll read the parentheses. Tani, Yavesh al Kizayas or Kizayas, Divrei Rabbi Nasan. That in order to be able to, um, if you wanted to know whether you have the right measurement of wine when the wine has congealed, <coughs> the shear is kazayas, meaning that when a revius of wine congeals, assuming that it's been diluted to the proper measurements, it congeals to a, 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 a kazayas of congealed wine. And the reason why this is relevant is, let's say, um, a person does an act of hotza on Shabbos, how much of congealed wine do you have to carry in order to be liable for carrying a requisite amount? And the answer is, is a kazayas. Rabbanon de Kesari v'Rabbiosi Barbibi b'Shem Shmuel Asya de Reb Nasan k'Reb Shimon. This goes like Reb Shimon. Kamad Reb Shimon Omar b'Revius Kain, or Kamad Reb Shimon Omar b'Revius. Just like Reb Shimon says by Revius that it has to congeal to a kazayas. Kain Amar Reb Nassan Berevius Lachesha Yikaresh V'Yehibo Kizaya. So too does Reb Nassan say that a Revius is considered to be a Revius of wine as far as its proper dilution um, ratio. If it when it evaporates and congeals, it congeals to a Kizayas of solid. Rabbi Simon B'Shem Rabbi Yeshua Ben Leivi Maisa B'Pretas Rabbi Shemesa B'Tiharu Es Dama Mishum Nevela. So now we have a similar issue about congealed blood. There was once a Misa that Rebbe's, uh, Rebbe Huda Nasi's mule died. And blood was oozing from its, I guess, the, the, the injury that caused it to die. And the blood came in contact with Taharos, and they wanted to know whether the Taharos were Tame or Tahar. And even though the flesh of a Nevela is Metame, but they said that the blood of the Nevela is not Metame. Bishal Rabbi Eliezer is Rabbi Simon at Kama. Rabbi Eliezer asked Rabbi Simon how much, meaning that is it only because there wasn't a specific amount of blood that they made a tahor, but more than that it would be tame. In other words, what what what's the what's the measurement? Velo Ashkach Bey. Rabbi Simon blew him off. You know, as he did, just ignored him. Okay. So then Rabbi Eliezer asked Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, and he told him, though, the reason why they were Metahir the Dam is only because there was not a Revius. Mm-hmm. But if there would be a Revius, it would be Tommy. Like the Korban Haida speaks out, um, it's because a Revius of Dam, when it congeals, forms a Kezaius of solid, then it's just like the Busser of a Nevela. Right, just like you need a kazayas of basar nevela to be matame, so to a kazayas of dam, which congeals to a kazayas of solid, is like a kazayas of basar. Whether that's derabanan or deraisa is debated among some of the mafortion, but the point is, is that it's still matame. Even before it congeals? Yes, it seems that way. It seems like even before it congeals. <laughs> So, Rabbi Eliezer is not finished with Rabbi Simon. He is upset. He's upset with Rabbi Simon. Ubash Rabbi Eliezer, Aldolo Chazale, Rabbi Simon, Shmuasa. Because Rabbi Simon, why did Rabbi Simon blow me off? Why didn't he respond to me? Rav Bibi Havayasiv Masni Hadenuvda. Rav Bibi was sitting and learning this whole story, this whole uh, series of events. 
Amar le Reb Yitzchak bar Kahana ad Reb Yis tohar Yosher mikan tome uba'at be. So Reb Yitzchak bar Kahana said to him, uh, and it's not clear who said to whom, but Reb Simon in just a minute is going to be involved in this case. So um, at least according to the to the Korban Ha'eder, Reb Simon gets involved. When he they he they they repeat the whole story, and um, and Rabbi Yitzchak says, "Tell me, Rabbi Simon, is it true that only up until Revius the blood is tohar, but more than Revius it's tame?" And Uba'at be Rabbi Simon, instead of just ignoring him this time, went ahead and kicked him. It's a touchy subject. So Amar Lei Rabbi Zreika began to shalach at Boat be. Just because he's asking you, you have a right to kick him? He's asking you a legitimate Shiloh. Why are you kicking him? So Amr Lay began to lo havas daiti bi bo itna be. He says, because I did not have peace of mind when he asked me the question, and he should have known that. He should have known that I'm not settled in my thoughts, and you should leave me alone. Be lucky I don't kick you when you ask me a Shiloh. <laughs> right? You sit the, what? You sit further away. Yeah. <laughs> the Amar Rebbe, <laughs> that's right. The Amar Rebbe Chanan v'Hayu Chayecha Tuluim Lachami Neged. The Torah gives a, uh, a a very strong rebuke, and one of the lines of the rebuke of the curse is that your life will be suspended before you. And then it says in the next part of the pasuk, this is you know from the Tochecha and Parshas uh, Kisavo, Ufachadato Laila V'Yamam, you'll be fearful night and day. Below Samin Bechayech, and you won't have faith in your life. Mm. So, what does this mean? So, the first part is, Your life will be suspended before you. That's a person who buys wheat wholesale for the entire year. Now, what that means is, is that if you have to buy wheat, it means you're not a farmer, you don't own property, and you're basically dependent upon others for your sustenance. So that's a certain level of insecurity. A higher level of insecurity is when the next part of the Pasuk says you'll be frightened night and day because you don't have enough money to buy wholesale, but instead you buy wheat retail in smaller increments. You go to Sobeys to buy the wheat instead of buying it from a wholesaler. And so that's even more insecurity, because you never know. Will he raise the price on me? Will there be supply? And so forth. Below Samin Bechayech, and the last part of the Pasuk is you won't, have, you won't believe in your own life, you won't have faith in your own life. That's the highest level of insecurity. That's where you have to buy bread. You don't even have the resources to bake your own bread from, from flour. You have to actually buy finished baked bread. That's the highest level of insecurity. You never know where your next meal is coming from. And Rabbi Simon says, because I uh, buy my bread from a baker, I have the highest level of insecurity. You should have been sensitive to my, uh, to my lack of security and therefore should have not pre- presented me with this challenge. So the Gemara now asks, so what was the upshot? In other words, what's the law? As far as congealed or blood that is the potential to congeal, what's the shear? So Hayid Rabbi Yeshua ben Pesora al Dam Nevela Shuhu Tohar. Rabbi Yeshua ben Pesora testifies that Dam Nevela is Tohar. And it sounds like he's saying it's unconditionally Tohar, mm-hmm. that regardless of whether it's less than a Revius or more than a Revius, it's always going to be Tohar. So the Gemara says you can't bring a Raya from there because maybe what he meant to say is Mahu Tohar, Tohar Milahachshir, Avolatamos Metame. Maybe all he meant to say is, is that the blood that oozes from a wound of a nevela is not one of the seven fluids that acts as a machshir to prime other foods, other foodstuffs to be makabal tuma. But as far as being a source of tuma itself, maybe it is a source of tuma. So that maybe Rabbi Shua ben Pesor might not have even been addressing our shaila. Taman taninan. So we learn a Mishnah or Brisa some uh, in Bavel that dam hasheret kibisaro. So there's a brisa that says that the blood of a sheretz is just like its flesh. It's metame, even though the fluid of the sheretz blood is not a machshir, it doesn't prime other things. 
and there's nothing else like it. So that statement that there's nothing else like it makes it sound like that only the blood of the Sheretz is Mitami, but the blood of Nevela is not Mitami. So again, we want to try and bring a Raya that even if you have more than a Revius of Dam Nevela, it's not going to be Mitami. So the Gemara says, no, that's not a Raya, because Vishir Tumaso, Shadama Mitami Kibisaro. All the g- Brisa means is that there's no other case like it where the amount of blood is exactly the same as the amount of flesh. Just like you only need an Adasha, the size of a lentil, in order of, of Sheretz flesh to be Matame, so to you only need a lentil size of Sheretz blood to be Matame. But it could very well be that Nevela blood is Matame, but whereas the flesh is a Kazayas, the fluid of Nevela blood is uh, Revius. And that's, and that's why it's different from Sheretz. But you can't bring a Raya that Nevela blood is not Matame at all from here. Amar Reb Yossi, Pligiba Trein Amoroin, Chadomer Tome Vechadomer Tohar. So we have a machlokas amoroim. One says that nevela blood is mitame as long as you have a revius, and the other one says that it's not. Man da amar tame kareb Yehuda, or man da amar tohar kareb Yeshua ben Pesora. If you hold that it's tame, it's because you're going like uh, it's going it's because you're going like Reb Yehuda, who had responded above that the uh, that it's ad revius up until the revius. It's um, it's um, it's tame, but but more than that, it's going to be uh, it, it, up until that it's tahor, and more than that, it's going to be tame. I'm trying to see where this Rebbe Yehuda is. Um, I'm not sure whether we quoted. I'm trying to see where we quoted Rebbe Yehuda up above, but at some point we had quoted R- Rebbe Yehuda, and Rebbe Yehuda had said that. Um, and because the other opinion who says that it's Torah is like Rabbi Yeshua ben Pesora, we had quoted Rabbi Yeshua ben Pesora. The Gemara had thought that perhaps he meant to say that unconditionally Dam Nevela is never Metame, and then the Gemara said maybe not necessarily so. It's reference to Rabbi on time. No, it's not. You'll see in just a second. It, Rabbi Yehuda Stam is not Rabbi, um, because Rabbi, that's Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. So, um, I'm trust, I, I thought I saw it seen it this morning. Oh, so it's a statement of Rebbe Yehuda in Idios. Okay, so maybe we didn't see it over here. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Amr le Rav Avduma de min nechusa v'yeos de Rebbe Yehuda moraino de ve'nesi ahava. It's uh, correct to say that it was Rebbe Yehuda who paskined that the blood is mitame, because after all, he was the posek of the house of the Nasi, of Rebbe. And so you see that Rebbe Yehuda is not the same as Rebbe. It's, uh, it was Rebbe's mule that was nifter, uh, that died, and so then they paskined that its blood was mitame, so that he, that he was the one who paskined that it's mitame if it's more than a revius. Okay, let's go weiter. Shema ye'ani v'yomru chule. We said that you're not supposed to wear any accessories to your clothing when you go in to do the Truma Salishka. Because people may think that you have pocketed some money into the sleeve or into one of the hems or something like that. And if you become poor, people will say, oh, you see why he became poor? Because he was, uh, he was embezzling money from the Beis HaMikdash. Tani Rebbe Yishmoel, Kavatz lo Yitrom Ipnei Achsha. There are a couple of explanations, but the one explanation of the Korban Eida is that a hairy guy should not do the Truma Salishka. If, you got, if you're a really hairy guy, you're disqualified from doing the Truma Salishka because we're worried that maybe you'll slip some coins into your hair. So someone pointed out to me, doesn't this only mean hairy? It could mean you've got a, just like a big, bushy, Hasidish beard. That could also possibly you from putting coins, because you could stick the coins, you know, like by some of the Hasidim, they roll up their beard, you know, so who knows what you got in there. Maybe you got last week's cholent in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so you could also have some of the coins from the Chumas Alishka. So Tani HaGizborim HaYu Mephasfasin Bekilkin. What they used to do is they used to comb the guy's hair Wherever he had hair, they would comb it out to make sure that there were no combs. Tani medabrin hayu imo mishashu hu nichnas at shashu hu yotzei. So they also another precaution they used to take is they would speak to the guy and make sure that he would respond from the moment that he went in until the moment that he left, so that to make sure he wasn't sticking any coins in his mouth. They said, "Oh, to tell us what's how's the weather out there today?" You know, and and so. So the Gemara says, but wait a minute, Why don't you just tell him to fill up his mouth with water and keep it in his cheeks? 
until he comes out. And that would also ensure that he would not put coins in his mouth. So, Amar Rebbe Tanchuma Mipnei HaBaracha. So he said, because he's got to make a bracha before doing truma salishka. So he's got to be able to sue, to have his mouth clear. So that's how they would remove the chashad. Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachman b'shem Rabbi Yonah's son, batoru v'anavim u'vaksuvim atzanu sh'adam tzarech latzei s'yidei ha-brios, k'derech shuhu tzarech latzei s'yidei ha-makam. That we find psukim in all of Tanakh, in Torah Nevim and Ksuvim, to prove this point that a person has to be not only above suspicion from God, but also above suspicion from man. The Torah Minai, and how do you see this in the Torah? That you shall be clean from God and from Israel. Now what's that? That's what Moshe says to B'nai God and B'nai Ruvain, who, wanted, who want to inherit a portion of land on the east side of the Jordan River, and Moshe accuses them. He says, maybe you're just trying to get out of uh, going out to war. So the way that you do this is you'll have to uh, fight with the rest of Klai Israel in order to be innocent or above suspicion in the eyes of both God and in the eyes of Israel. So you see very clearly. Elokim Hashem. Uh, the rest of the Pasuk is Kel Elokim Hashem, Kel Elokim Hashem, Hu Yodeya, the Yisrael Hu Yeda. That God is God and He will know and Yisrael will know. Now, what this Pasuk was talking about is that it was discovered that a facsimile of the Mishkan had been constructed by B'nai God and B'nai Ruvain in the times of Yehoshua on the eastern side of the Jordan. Well, this is scandalous because people thought that this was like a competing temple where they were offering. Avodah Zarah, you know, offerings to a foreign god. So they were accused of, um, you know, of violating, you know, basic law. So they said, no, God knows and mankind shall know that we're not doing this as an act of rebellion. We only did this to show how much affection we have for the Mishkan in, in Shiloh uh, or in Gilgal, wherever it was at the time. And we, it's, it's a non-operating facsimile. It's just there to remind us of the Mishkan. So, so therefore, you see again, they did this to say God knows, right, and man knows. And baksuvim minayin dechsiv umatzah chayim v'seichel tov bein elokim ve'adam. Pasuk in Mishlei, which says that a person has to find comeliness and good intellect, not only in the eyes of Hashem but in the eyes of mankind as well. We say this in our benching. Benim sachein v'seichel tov bein elokim ve'adam. Now Gamliel Zuga Shola Reb Yosi Bar Rebbe Bon Ezehu Amachuver Shabakulam. Which pasuk most clearly indicates this principle that you have to be above suspicion in man's eyes as much as in God's eyes? Amar Lei Vesim the Kiyam Me Hashem Amiso. The pasuk in the Chumash, which says that Bnei Gad and Bnei Reuven were told by Moshe that you need to be clean in both God's eyes and in Israel's eyes. Next, go on to the next Mishnah Halacha Gimel Masnishin Shel Beis Rav and Gamliel Hayanichnas. We learned this before, that the, the, the emissary of Rabbi Gamliel's house would make sure that right as they were about to do the Truma Salishka, he would lift up his coin conspicuously and throw it forcefully right in front of uh, the scooper, right? And so that when he would scoop it up, he would make sure to get Rabbi Gamliel's coin. Because Rabbi Gamliel wanted to make sure that his coin made it into the box where they were scooping up the coins. And by the way, there's a tremendous amount of discrepancy in the Meforshim, exactly how the Trumas Halishka was done. Today we're going to be learning like the Taklin Chadatin and trying to explain this whole process of the three times of the year when they did the Trumas Halishka. But understand that according to the Korban Ha'ida, there's a, a, a dramatically different procedure or protocol. Now there's an issue of etiquette, of derech eretz. When the person was getting ready to do the truma salishka, the scooping up from the chamber, he would first say to all others present, shall I scoop? And they said to him, yes, trom, 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 scoop, scoop, scoop. They would say to him three times, this was words of encouragement, and they went ahead and said that. Taramis Arishona Vichipa Bikat Vikat Belios that he would scoop up from the first uh, um, uh, groupings of co- grouping of coins, and then once that scooping was done, they would scoop up from the three boxes, the Aleph Bays and Gimel, like we learned from the previous Mishnah. Then they would place a sheet or a blanket over those coins. Hashniya Vikipa Bikat Belios, then they would 
wait for the next influx of coins. Remember, if you recall, there were, there were multiple influxes of coins. Most people who lived nearby got their coins in by the first of Nisan. But according to one opinion, like we spoke out in the first barrack, if you, did, if you lived further away, there was another influx of coins that came later in the year. And that's why they had to do the Truma Salishka on, right before Shavuos to, to, uh, to sort of um, uh, use that, those coins up as well. And then there was an even later influx of coins that came uh, by the end of the summer. So therefore, what they did is they, once they did the first Truma Salishka on the first of Nisan, they covered it up with a sheet, whatever remained. Then another the next influx of coins came in, resting on top of that sheet, and then when they did the second Truma Salishka right before Shavuos, they put a sheet over the remaining coins, and then the final influx of coins came in by the end of the summer. And two weeks before Sukkot, they also did the Truma Salishka. And Hashlishas lo haya mechape. The third uh, uh, set of coins was not covered on top. The lama haya mechape, shameyishkach v'yitro min hadavar hatarum. And the reason why they covered up with sheets is so that they shouldn't get the coins mixed up and forget and scoop up from coins that had already that had already been been tithed. Taramis are Rishona Lashem Eretz Israel, Vashni Lashem Krachem Amukafimla, Vashli Shlash Lashem Bavel, Lashem Madai, Ulashem Medinos Harachokos. And the first scooping, who did they do it for? It was the people who brought their coins in on time on the first of Nisan, because they lived in Eretz Yisrael and the surrounding area. The second influx of coins came from people who lived a little bit further away, but still in the Middle Eastern region, like Syria, like Jordan, you know, perhaps in Egypt, those nearby areas. And those people, it took them a little bit longer, but eventually they got them in. And the third influx of coins was from people who came from even further away, from media, from Bavel, like from Iran, Iraq, that took a, even a longer amount of time, so those people got their coins in by the end of the summer, and that's who the third scooping was for. The Gemara now says, Shal Beis Rabbi Gamliel v'chulei. So let's go back to that story. Rabbi Gamliel's house would make sure that Rabbi Gamliel's machatzis shekel would get, for sure, get scooped up. So the Gemara says, I don't understand. Ilu hayu shnei kariyam v'tara me'echad mehen al chavero shemalo patr chavero? He says, look, you have two piles of grain. If I have two piles of grain in front of me and I take I tithe from one pile, having in mind that the tithe is going for both piles, would you ever entertain that it only works for one pile and not for another pile? Of course, as long as whatever you have in mind for, the truma works for both piles. So similarly, why did Rabbi Gamliel have to make sure that his coin got into the box? The coins are from all of Klal Yisrael, and the truma is a tithe that covers all of the coins. So regardless of whether your coin gets in the box or whether it stays on the floor, the bottom line is is that it's being done for your coin, that truma, and so therefore the korbanos count for you. So why, does, why was Rebbe Gamliel so hung up on making sure that his coin got in? So the Gemara answers, Hanachas ruach ilahem, shelo yehi korban miskarev elo mishalahen techila. That Rebbe Gamliel, because I guess he was the Nasi, he wanted to have a special zuchus of making sure that it was Dafka, his coin, that was used to purchase the Karbanos. I was just telling someone over, I, I had heard, and I don't know the truth of it or not, but I believe that something that's often quoted is that when you give tzedakah, depending on how worthy you are, will determine whether the money goes for like something really important in that tzedakah, or something like for the toilet paper, you know? Or for the Meshulam. Or for what? And for the mishulach, not to the stuck. Right, or for the mishulach, and not for the yeah. stuck. Yeah. Right. In other words, right. like you have to try, you have to really have zchuyos in order to be zocha to have your money go for the like the really important stuff. How do you do it practically? Didn't they just drop it in the box in the kupa? Like the way it sounds here, it's like you throw well, it to the, the guy that's un, un, under normal circumstances. You sent your machatzis shekel and you put it in a pushka, so. and then they would just dump all the coins on the floor. Rabbi Gamliel had, was the Nasi, so he had connections. So he made sure that a Kohen, who was his proxy, would get in there and would just be standing there as they were doing the Trumas Alishka and get it on top. Yeah, throw okay. the coin in. Is so Rabbi talking about the actual money that goes to the particular tzedakah? In other words, you're saying that if you have, if you have a special tzedakah, your money special goes to something? That's right. In that tzedakah, like you, let's say you donate to a yeshiva, right? In modern day, it's impossible, right? What do you yeah, mean? You write a check, all money is transferred. Yeah. No such thing. 
Right, right. So you know, but I'm saying in the old days when people yeah, people would days, give sure, people would give would give cash. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's no such thing. Today. Right, that's true. Maybe maybe that maybe that's a good thing. You know. In fact, most people's tzedakahs are probably going to some venture capitalists in China. <laughs> okay, it's not, as long as it makes money for the yeshiva. Okay. All right. So Tani shamat es hakatablios nasu kulan shiraim. So I guess after the scooping was done, then they would remove the sheets, and everything, all the coins combined together, and everything became shirayim, was the leftover coins. Tani shlishisi haisa, ashira shebekulan shahayuba isterios shel zahuv, the darkono shel zahuv. He says, the, the, the Brysa says that the third influx of coins that came from the faraway places had the most expensive coins in them. They had the most uh, the most value. And the reason is, if you recall, we learned before that if people lived far away and it was burdensome to schlep silver half-shekel coins, they would convert this half-shekel coins into larger gold coins, more expensive gold coins. So you typically found the gold coins on the top level. Those are the most valuable. Tani, Tarim Esarishonos L'Shem Eretz Yisrael. So the Bryson now says that it wasn't when you did the first Shemus Lishka, it was exclusively for B'nai Eretz Yisrael. You also had in mind all of Klal Yisrael. It's a, it's a very nice thought. In other words, there was some specificity that since you, the people who brought their coins on time were usually the B'nai Eretz Yisrael, but you also thought about all of Klal Yisrael. Shnia l'shem krochim amukafim l'shem kol Yisrael. The second scooping, which was from the surrounding areas, for a little bit further away, that was for the people of those areas, plus all of Israel. And Beashlishis, Lushem Bavlu Modai, Ulushem Medino Sarachokim, Ulushem Kol Israel. And the same thing for the third Truma is that you would have in mind the people who came from far away, but also for all of Klal Israel. So it's again, it's a nice idea of having both collective, a specific and collective in mind, meaning the general and the specific in mind for each Truma. Tani, Natal Minharishona. So the Bryson now also says that when you took from the... Now this is talking about, it would seem to me, um, it's talking about the... Um, uh, I think, uh, this would be according to everyone, but I have to double check. Um, that it's, Yeah, it's talking about the kupos, it's talking about the boxes. The Taklan Chadatin says the same thing. Here we're talking about the boxes that they scooped up. And each time they did a Truma Salishka, there were three boxes, remember? So you would take, typically, there was there were three boxes were labeled Aleph, Bez, and Gimel, or Aleph, Beta, and Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. And when you, when you had the first box, which was labeled Aleph, you took your first scoop, uh, uh, you know, a fistful of coins from the first box, you purchased animals from it. Then you went to the second box. In other words, you didn't exhaust the first box before going to the second. You went to take up a bunch from the first, then you went to the second. And and then you'd go to the third box. Then And then you exhaust the third box. So once there's no more coins left in the third box, because there's a lot of korbanos that you have to buy, chozer l'shniya. Then you go back to the second box. Shal m'shniya, chozer l'rishon. And then when the, when the, uh, when the uh, second box is finished, you go back to the first box. And then shal m'shloshton, if all the boxes are exhausted, and you still need to purchase more korbanos, so what are you supposed to do? Chozer v'shoyke. Then you should go back and reassess Klal Yisrael. You basically make an announcement and saying we've run out of shekels, we need more donations. Now the alternative would be just to go back to the lishka and do more scooping because uh, there's always coins left on the floor. But the Bryce says no, you don't do that. What's ever left is called shirayim, and you don't deal, you don't, you don't use that for, you don't use that for further karbanos. Rabbi Meir Omer Chozer Lishirayim. Reb Meir disagrees, and he says, no, before you reassess the community, go back into the Lishka and scoop out whatever coins are left. And the reason is, Shahaya Reb Meir Omer, Mo'alim Bishirayim, Shemit Starchulahem Besof, that Rabbi Meir says 
that that's the reason why the Shirayim coins, the leftover coins on the floor of the Lishka, are subject to Me'ila, because they are sanctified, because there's always the possibility that you may need to use those coins if you need extra to purchase extra carbonos. Now, v'chein ha'ya Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair Omer, and so too Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair used to say. Now, what does it mean, and so did he used to say? Like, what is this connection? So, um, so the Karban Ha'eda points out that he's going on Reb Meir's statement that the Shirayim, the leftover coins in the Lishka, are subject to Me'ila because people may need them. And so in the same vein, Rabbi Pinchas used to say that a person has to be very careful and very zealous in his avoda so as not to come to sin because you never know what the future will bring. It was like the statement of Rabbi Meir, don't, don't use those coins that are shirayim for personal use because you never know what the future will bring. So, so, th- so this is this brisa is the famous brisa that's quoted by the Ramchal at the beginning of Mesilas Yisharm because it appears in the Bavli as well. And he used to say as follows, Zerizus mevi'ali de nekios. Now if you notice, there's a little piece missing because the original brisa says that the uh, Zehirus mevi'ali de Zerizus, right? So it doesn't start that way in the Yerushalmi. First Torah. What? Torah. To, to the, the heroes, and the heroes to the Zerizos. Right. Right. So, so here it just starts with Zerizos, which is alacrity or zeal or excitement, passion, brings a person to Nikios. Nikios, cleanliness doesn't mean a physical cleanliness, it means purification from sin or atonement from sin. Nikios mevili de Tahara, that brings to spiritual purity. And Tahara Mevili De Kedusha, that brings to holiness. Kedusha Mevili De Anava, that brings to humility. Anava Mevili De Yiraschait, that brings a person to fear of sin. Yiraschait Mevili De Chasidus, that brings a person to piety, which is going above and beyond the letter of the law. Chasidus Mevili De Ruach HaKodesh, that brings a person to divine inspiration. Ruach HaKodesh Mevili De Tchias Amesin, that brings one to resurrection. And Tchias Amesin Mevili De Eliyahu Zachur Latov. And that brings one to um, Elio Anovi. Now, what that means, it brings a person to Elio Anovi, you would think that Trias Amesim is the highest Madrega, because Elio Anovi is the herald for Mashiach. So, how can Mashiach come be, um, you know, after Trias Amesim? It's out of order. Uh, so, the Carbon Eda tries to mitigate that. He says that there's a pre Messianic Trias Amesim like we find in the times of Yechezkel that God told them to resurrect the dry bones. So Tchiyas HaMesim is not the ultimate Tchiyas HaMesim that takes place at the end of all days. It's resurrection that can happen even in this life when people are so holy that their spirit is completely restored. Whether it's to be taken literally or metaphorically, it's not clear. So anyway, the Gemara now speaks it out. Zerizus mevi'ali de nekios t'chse v'chila mi kaper. The Torah talks about the Kohen's Avoda on Yom Kippur, and it says that he shall finish from atoning. The chila is a language of kiloi, which is do, doing something quickly with excitement. And when you do something with excitement, what do you do? You're a machapir. You atone. That's called nikius. Nikius may vili de tahara. And how do you know that nikius brings to purity? That after a woman is given childbirth, the, the coin will atone for her sin. And she shall be pure. So you see that that's a result of atonement, is purity. Tahara mivili de kedusha, and that in turn brings to holiness. Dechsiv the tiharo v'kiddusha. Going back to Yom Kippur, it says that he shall purify and he shall sanctify. So one follows the other. Kedusha mivili de anava. How do you know that holiness brings to uh, humility? Dechsiv kicha maram v'nisa shochin ad v'kadosh shemo. Because this is a pasuk in Yeshaya, so says he who is truly exalted, who lives in who, in, in holiness, is his name. Marom v'kadosh eshkon, I shall dwell in the lofty and holy place. Ve'esdaka ushval ruach, but I shall support and lift up the, um, the the crushed and the lowly of spirit. So you see that Hashem's kedusha brings uh, to anava to to humility. Anava mevili de yiras chet, and that in turn brings one to fear of sin. Dirsiv, ekev anava yiras Hashem. That Mishlei it says that a result of humility is the fear of God. And yiras chet mevili de ches. Is that in turn brings to piety, going above and beyond the letter of the law. Dirsiv v'chesed Hashem me olam v'ad olam al yireyav. That the kindness which represents chasidus, 
of Hashem is eternal for those who fear Him. Okay, Chasidus Mivele De Ruch HaKodesh, and piety in turn brings to divine inspiration. Dechsev, Oz Dibarta Bachason Lachasidecha, that you speak in a vision to your pious ones. So you see that the two are directly related. Ruach HaKodesh Mivele De Tchias Amesim Dechsev, how do you know that the divine inspiration leads to resurrection? Because it says, Venosati Ruchi Bochem Vichiisem. I shall place my spirit within you, that's the Ruach HaKodesh, and you shall live, you shall be resurrected. How do you know that resurrection brings to Eliyahu? And the way that the Mephor, the way Tachlan Chadatin speaks out is that the day of judgment that is being discussed where Eliyahu comes immediately before, that day of judgment has to come right after Tchiyas HaMesim. So you see that Eliyahu Navi comes after Tchiyas HaMesim, before judgment. So that's how you see that Tchiyas HaMesim brings Eliyahu. Tana b'shem Rabbi Meir, kol misha kavua be'eretz Yisrael, medabra b'loshan ha-kodesh, v'ochol peirosa v'tara v'kar kriyishma, b'bok yiru v'erev, yeh mevusar sheben olam ha-bahu. Rabbi Meir says that anyone who is established in Eretz Yisrael, he lives, he makes his home, he made Aliyah, and makes his home in Eretz Yisrael, he speaks in Lashon HaKadosh, he speaks Hebrew like any Israeli does, and he eats peros b'tahara, because he goes to buy it from the makolet, from Tenuva, they, they tithe properly, and everything is done properly, and all he has to do is say Kriyashma in the morning and the evening, he gets Olam Haba. You live in Golis, <laughs> oy, there's a much longer laundry list of things you got to do. But you live in Eretz Yisrael, ah, I'm a chaya. The fact that you live in Eretz Yisrael, you have the Kedush of Eretz Yisrael, you speak Lashon HaKodesh, you eat the, the, the Peros of Eretz Yisrael, you just say Kriyashma in the morning and the night, you're set for life. Go to Lupan and you're ready. You go to Lupan and you're ready. Hajim Allah Perak Bishlosha Prakim. Okay, Halacha Aleph in the next the next parak, the next Mishnah. We'll just do the Mishnah today. Hatruma Mahaya Osin. Um Mahaya Osin. But what did they do with the Truma? Like what purchases did they make with the Truma? So we've talked about you purchase communal karbana. So the Mishnah speaks out. Lo Khimba Timidu Musafim, they buy the daily twice a day the Tamid, the sheep, for the day, uh, twice a day Tamid offering, once in the morning, once in the evening, Umusafin, and the carbon Musaf, Viniskehem, and all of their libations, Haomer Shtehalechem, the carbon Haomer on the, for the 16th of Nisan is purchased from that, the Shtehalechem, the two loaves of bread on Shavuos is purchased from that, Lechem Haponim, the weekly show bread is purchased from those monies, the Chol Karbanos, and all other community Karbanos. Now, during Shemitah, you're not allowed to plant, you're not allowed to cultivate. So where did they get the grain, the barley that was growing in order to bring the carbon Haomer uh, during the Shemitah year? So the answer is, is that it would grow wild. But they would have to appoint people just to watch over it to make sure that it wouldn't get trampled upon. So for that barley that they were anticipating to use for the carbon Haomer, they would hire people, the basin would hire people to sort of act as the protectors of that patch of land, and they would pay them for that service. Rabbi Yossi Omer, no. Rabbi Yossi says, you didn't need to pay anyone, it would be considered a privilege. People would be happy to do that for free, and it was not necessary to pay them. So Amrulo, Afata Omer, Shein Boyin, Ela Mishal Tzibor. And the rabbi said no to Rabbi Yossi. You have to pay the guys that do that job because otherwise, someone who watches over a patch of land that's hefker, if he if he's watching over it, he's kind of the grain that's growing there. And if there if the guy that's watching it is kind of it, and then it becomes now an individual's property instead of the tzibors, and he can't use it for the carbon homer, which has to be Michel Tzibor. Yeah. Have a wonderful day. Yeah.